Now, what do you think of that? Medley, played by the Edison Military Band. <laughs> So, that's my talk tonight, and actually, Ben did such a good job that I can push through a bunch of slides and get to the meat of it. There's something he talked about. If I were hit by a truck today, this would be what I'd be remembered for in 10 years. He talked about that. There's me with the man. That's me on the right. <laughs> um, and then this next one, I'm wondering how many people know... The guy with his arms folded in that wonderfully coordinated outfit <laughs> and the long hair is me. Anyone know who that guy who's even shorter than me is on the left? Anyone? Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, one of the most famous, some people regard him as the best or most, most accomplished economist of the last half of the 20th century. People who don't think that would certainly put him no lower than third. Um, and he's a part of my story tonight. Whoops. Getting ahead of myself. So, we don't necessarily think of economists as being activists against oppressive government programs. And that's because they typically aren't. But there was a time in history when I was a teenager, when a few dozen American economists quite actively worked against the military draft, and they succeeded. On January 27, 1973, conscription of men into the U.S. military ended, and on June 30th of that year, the law that had authorized conscription expired. How the economists helped end the draft, and I emphasize helped, I don't know whether the contribution was 5% or 20%, but I think it was between those two numbers. And the actions they took and the arguments they made is an exciting story. It's an untold story, unfortunately, and so it's one I want to tell you tonight. At the time, this was the late 1960s, I followed the debate closely. Although I'm originally Canadian, eh? <laughs> and Ben didn't mention that, and I lived in Canada when most of those events I'll talk about occurred, I was a passionate opponent of the draft, even then. I opposed it not because I was at risk of being drafted. In Canada, we had an even stronger milita uh, volunteer military tradition than they have in the United States. It was because I was and am philosophically opposed to the draft, morally opposed to the draft. So before going on to tell the story, I should at least tell you a little about why I'm so philosophically against the draft. And I want to do it not in an abstract way, but in a concrete way. I'm going to give you a gift. Anything wrong with what I just did? Anyone? Who, raise your hand if you think what I did was legitimate. Raise your hand if you think what I did was wrong. You're going to be an easy crowd. <laughs> That's why I'm against the draft. The government takes something from someone, something way, whatever this value is, Jamie, it's way more important than this, and gives it not to someone else, but rather to the government, takes it for itself. Now, let me pick on someone else. Uh, Miss, I promise I won't embarrass you. I hope I don't embarrass you. You have very nice hair. Now, what if, the next thing I did was kind of hold you down and cut your hair. Uh, and uh, let's see, I want to be handled both gender. Sir, with your glasses, you have very nice hair. What if I just held you down and cut your hair very short? Who here, raise your hand if you think that's right. Raise your hand if you think that's wrong. You have just agreed with my philosophical case against the draft. If you look at what happened when people went into the military, especially the guys, 
They had their haircut and they had no choice about it. So here's how I put it. The draft was, there was a threat of renewing the draft in 1979 and I gave a talk at an anti-draft rally at Carnegie Mellon University. And here's how I put it. What is the thinking of the people who advocate the draft? Whatever their differences, they have one thing in common. They believe that you are a national resource. Well, I'm here to tell you that you belong to you. That you are not a piece of clay to be molded by others. That nobody has the right to take you against your will, no matter who they are, how many votes they have, or what they intend to use you for. So my philosophical case is that we own our own bodies. You own your own body. And we have the right to decide what to do with our bodies. But two incidents happened early in the time I was following this. I was reading about it, so it was still a little abstract. I wasn't at risk, as I said, I was in Canada. But two incidents happened that made it a little more concrete for me. In 1969, at age 18, I attended a political conference at Rockford College in Rockford, Illinois. I came down from Winnipeg and went to Rockford. And there were a lot of young men my age, 18, 19, and they were sweating the draft. The Vietnam War was going full tilt, and they were now subject to the draft. And I had a lot of sympathy for them. And so it got me thinking about that even more, the, the threat they were being put under. And that made me appreciate living in Canada. The second thing is the next year I hitchhiked across, I was 19, I hitchhiked across Canada and down the west coast to LA and stayed with various people I met, stayed on their couches and so on. And I stayed with this guy in Tacoma, Washington, who was working at an anti-war coffee house called The Shelter Half. It was right next to Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis was the next stop for people on the way to Vietnam. And so some of the people in the military, especially the younger people, wanted to come down to that coffee house in the evenings and just be away from kind of the military life. And I was there with my friend and I would just hang out and talk to people. And I saw this man about from me to that, that distance there with a military uniform on who looked my age. And there's just something compelling about him. And I went up and as I got closer, and for this to have any impact, you've got to remember my name. What's my name? My whole name? David Henderson. As I got closer, they all had these little name tags, and on his name tag it says, David Henderson. So I told him that was my name. We get talking. I said, you look kind of nervous, kind of scared. He goes, I am. I said, how come? He says, I'm going to be in that tomorrow. And then we just got time about other things. And I said, and also I mentioned I'm from Canada. <laughs> that matters. I said, where'd you grow up? He goes, North Dakota. I said, where in North Dakota? He says, you never would have heard of it. Try me. Dunseith. Dunseith was 29 miles south of where I grew up. And my family and I used to go to movies there Sunday night because they didn't have movies. They weren't, didn't allow movies on Sundays in my province. And we'd go down to Dunseith to watch movies. And it just brought it home even more. I got lucky by 29 miles. I was not at risk of her. And I was at the Reagan White House when the Vietnam War, War Memorial was put up. And of course, the first thing I did was go over there and see if his name was on it. And fortunately, it wasn't. So that's my own little experience of it that, that really drove all this home for me. Now, we've had a volunteer military tradition in this country. We had a draft at, in the First World War from 1917 to 1918, but then it ended. Then we got it before we got in World War II, 1940. It ended in 47 for a year, and then it was put back in 48, and we had it to 1973. It became a big issue in the 60s. And one of the people who got involved and started writing about it was Milton Friedman, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. And in December 1966, various prominent academics and politicians met at a four-day conference at the University of Chicago where Milton Friedman was 
to give papers and discuss the draft. The politicians included anti-draft congressman Robert Kastenmeier, a Democrat from Wisconsin, and Congressman Donald Rumsfeld, a Republican from Illinois, who you might have heard of. He was later defense secretary. And one pro-draft senator, Senator Edward Kennedy. Also attending were pro-draft anthropologist Margaret Mead and anti-draft economist Milton Friedman and Walter Oy. I'm going to say something in a minute about Walter Oy. And reading through the book that came out of this, because I read it shortly after it happened, and the transcript of the discussion was one of the most exciting things I've done intellectually, just seeing people contending with these issues and contending with the arguments <coughs> the economists made, which I will get to very shortly. And one of Friedman's comments about the draft, about this conference, that he said in his autobiography, is worth noting. He said, I've attended many conferences. I've never attended any other that had so dramatic effect on the participants. A straw poll taken at the outset of the conference recorded two-thirds of the participants in favor of the draft. A similar poll at the end, two-thirds opposed. A shift of one-third. I believe that this conference was the key event that started the ball rolling decisively toward ending the draft. Now, other important economists included these young graduate students who became economists at the University of Virginia. And they put together a book called Why the Draft that Penguin put out, and it sold 30,000 copies. Now, 30,000 copies of a book on the draft by economics nerds? That's incredible. And yet that's what it did. And what they did, and what Milton Friedman did, was bring a specifically econo economic argument to the discussion that hadn't been well known, and by the way, is no longer well known, if it ever was. And it relied on the concept of opportunity cost. The usual view is that for a given size military, a draft is cheaper for an obvious reason. When they draft you, they do not have to pay you much. And, and, and short-term pay was really quite, sorry, uh, first-term pay was really quite low. And so people look at that and say, well, if we got rid of the draft, we'd have to pay those people more, and that's true. Therefore, the cost of the drafted military is lower than the cost of an all-volunteer force. That was the argument made. What did, economists, what did economists add to this discussion? They added this. You, you who say that that's the measure of the cost have it wrong. The cost should include the cost of the whole society. Draftees are part of society. And so when they go into the military, the cost to them is their opportunity cost. Who here remembers the term opportunity cost? Yeah, it actually has an application. <laughs> the opportunity cost is the value of the highest valued opportunity foregone. So if someone was choosing not to be in the military, or would have chosen not to be in the military, and is in the military because of the draft, they're giving up something valuable. There's a related concept in economics that's highly correlated with opportunity cost called supply price. Your supply price is the minimum you would have had to be paid to be willing to be there. So a measure of the cost to them is whatever they're paid as draftees minus their supply price, and their supply price will typically be lower if they don't want to be there, so it's a negative number. They're losing a lot. And one of the most famous examples of a huge opportunity cost, huge supply price, was Elvis Presley. Who here has heard of Elvis Presley? I remember I was seven years old when he was drafted in 1958, and he was in there for two years. Think about his opportunity cost. He was paid approximately two or three thousand a year at a time when he would have made a million dollars a year in 1958 dollars. That is a huge, huge opportunity cost. Now that's an extreme example, but think of a more typical example. Someone who wanted to go on to be a doctor. Think of someone who wanted to be a football player. 
think of the short lives as football players they have. I think the median number of years as a NFL player is 3.5, something like that. And they might miss those. And that's huge for that person because they don't have great opportunities outside of the NFL. So think of all those things. Also, the draft puts into the military people who don't want to be there instead of paying more and getting people who want to be there. And so you get, to use the title of a book written that made this point, you get the wrong man in uniform. And so you get a high opportunity cost person displaying a, displacing a low opportunity cost person, so you have a net increase in cost. And that's, that was the insight the economists had. As I think I mentioned, in 1979, there was a move to reintroduce the draft. <coughs> By this time, I was an assistant professor at the University of Rochester, and I got energized about this and figured out how to get someone to pay me so I could go down and testify. Just my expenses, by the way. Uh, that was a cheap date in those days. And I testified before Senator Sam Nunn of the, uh, from Georgia of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And here's how I put it because he and I went back and forth in a fairly testy manner. Because he was saying that draft of military is cheaper. And here's what I said. What I am saying is that the cost of a good quality military is there. There's no avoiding that fact. All you are talking about is whom you make bear the cost. The cost is not any lower when you are paying 30% of the budget in wages. It is just that you are imposing that cost on these young people. That is what you are advocating. You are not advocating a lower cost military. You are not advocating lower cost of labor. You are just advocating the taxpayers in general not bear the cost, and young draftees bear the cost. And here's how the, the title of this slide was the title of an article written by one of the heroes, who I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, a guy named William Meckling in an article in Fortune magazine when he was fighting against bringing back the draft. He said, the draft is a high tax on unlucky young men. So here's an example. The numbers were way lower then, but I'm trying to, trying to give you a, an example in our 2017 dollars. Let's say they implement a draft and pay people $14,000 to be in the military, <coughs> but their supply price, the minimum they would have had to be paid is 26,000. Compute the tax. It, the implicit tax is $12,000. That is a very high percent. Now, um, there's another cost, and that is the cost of avoidance. When there's a draft, people are going to try to find ways around the draft. So, for example, if you got married, you had a better chance of avoiding it. So a lot of very quick marriages. If you had a kid, there was a better chance of avoiding it. If you went to college, there was a better chance of avoiding it. And I do think, I haven't done the study, but this is my casual empiricism, that that's when great inflation started. You're gonna get a C, you're gonna get kicked out. <coughs> professor, professor, I'm going to Vietnam. Oh, okay, you get a B. And so there are all kinds of ways. I had a professor, an economics professor at UCLA, who ate, who loved donuts, and he ate a dozen donuts a day for 30 days so he could flunk his physical, and it worked. And in fact, there was a song about this back then called The Draft Dodger Rag. Anyone know that song? Anyone want to hear that song? The Little Corks? I'm going to do it in. <laughs> well, I'm just 18, got a ruptured spleen, and I always carry a purse. Got eyes like a bat, and my feet are flat, and my asthma's getting worse. Think of my career, got a sweetheart, dear, and a poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no school fool, I'm a going to school, and I'm working in a defense plant. <laughs> now, ah, I want to get there. Um... One of the people 
who's very important, I'm going to show his picture in a minute, is a man named Martin Anderson. Martin Anderson was a young economist at Columbia University in the 1960s. And he was philosophically against the draft for the reasons I gave. And Richard Nixon was planning to run for president in 1968. And Marty was teaching at Columbia University, so he's right there in New York where Nixon was. And he approached Nixon and persuaded Nixon, A, that the draft was raw, and B, that Nixon should run on an anti-draft platform. And he wrote Nixon's speech that he gave on CBS radio during the campaign, which he was all about ending the draft and why we should end the draft. And that, that was one of the important pieces. Another of the important pieces, another economist who was very important in this, is an economist named Walter Oy. I don't know if you can tell from this picture, he was blind. He was an amazing man. Some people say he should have won the Nobel Prize in economics. He had no personal interest in getting rid of the draft because he had two daughters. And he did an estimate of the budgetary cost of getting rid of the draft and gave this presentation at that 1966 conference at the University of Chicago I mentioned. And the number was high, but it wasn't as high as many people had thought it would be. So he was important in that discussion. So Nixon comes in, and um, oh, and then here's Martin Anderson. Nixon comes in, and you ever heard of politicians breaking their campaign promises? <laughs> so have I. So it's Marty. So Marty joins his administration to try to hold Nixon's feet to the fire. And within a couple of months, Marty gets him to appoint the Gates Commission. It's the, te the official term is the President's Commission on the All-Volunteer Force. And the executive director was William H. Mecklen, whom I'll tell you about in a few minutes. And I saw Mecklen give a talk on this once, and he said he kind of went in there innocently. He thought he loved to drop his G's on ING words. He said, I thought my purpose was estimating supply curves. In other words, he thought, I'm going to be executive director because everyone's agreed we're going to get rid of the draft, and I'm just estimating supply curves, how much more do we have to pay? And a little background on him. Uh, I was at a conference on the draft in 1979 that Meckling was at, Friedman was at, a few other people were at. And one pres presenter said that he... This was a presenter who was against the draft. He was a military manpower economist. He said, well, of course, during the war, during an all-out war, we would move to a draft. No one in this room believes different. Well, I, I knew that was false. <laughs> and so next time I got, when we got to q and I said, well, there is one person in this room who believes different, me. And by the way, there's another one, William Mecklen. Because when I interviewed his school years uh, in 75 at the University of Rochester, we got talking about his role in that, and he told me he was against the draft in World War II. And he pointed out that the draft causes the military to misuse, to abuse manpower because they're not paying the full price. And he talked about all the ways manpower is misused on army bases in World War II when he was drafted just picking up cigarette butts and doing things that aren't that useful. And here's an extreme about the misuse of manpower. This is from an economist named Von Thunen, who was critical of the draft back in the middle of the 19th century. And here's what he said. The reluctance to view a man as capital is especially ruinous of mankind in wartime. Here, capital is protected, but not man. And in time of war, we have no hesitation in sacrificing 100 men in the bloom of their years to save one cannon. In 100 men, at least 20 times as much capital is lost as is lost in one cannon. But the production of the cannon is the cause of the expenditure of the state treasury, while human beings are again available for nothing but by means of a simple conscription order. And here's the kind of the blood curve in court. When the statement was made to Napoleon, the founder of the conscription system, that a planned operation would cost too many men, he replied, 
Sanaria. It is nothing. The women produce more of them than I can use. So Meckling saw through that. Now in 1998, Meckling died, and I wrote a tribute to him in a monthly column I was writing for a, a, a Silicon Valley publication at the time. And here's what I said. If you're, in, this was 1998, so you've got to adjust to think about your age. If you're an American male under age 44, take a moment of silence to thank William F. Meckling, who died last year at age 76. Even though you probably haven't heard of him, he has had a profound effect on your life. What he did was to help end military conscription in the United States. Between 1948 and 1973, here's what you knew if you were a healthy male born in the USA. The government could pluck you out of almost any activity you were pursuing, cut your hair, and send you anywhere in the world. If the United States was at war, you might have to kill people, and you might return home in a body bag. Um, to research that article, I interviewed, I called up his widow, Becky Mecklen, whom I'd known when I was one of his employees. And she told me, she reminisced about him and the Gates Commission when he was executive director. And one debate from her husband's day stood out in her mind. One she said that had delighted Bill when he came home that night. He was all excited in a very positive way. And it was about a debate between Milton Friedman, one of the members of the Gates Commission, one of the 15 members, and General West, William Westmoreland, who had been the commander of the troops at, in Vietnam and was at the time the chief of staff of the US Army. Uh, Westmoreland was the proponent of the draft. And in his testimony before the commission, Westmoreland said he didn't want to command an army of mercenaries. And Friedman said, General, would you rather command an army of slaves? Westmoreland replied, I don't like to hear our patriotic draftees referred to as slaves. Friedman responded, I don't like to hear our patriotic volunteers referred to as mercenaries. If they are mercenaries, then I serve a mercenary professor. You, sir, are a mercenary general. We are served by mercenary physicians. We use a mercenary lawyer, and we get our meat from a mercenary butcher. I mean, all Friedman was pointing out is, everyone who gets paid and volunteers is a mercenary by Westmoreland standards, including Westmoreland, mm -hmm. and including Friedman. Uh, is anyone here a slave? Good. Anyone here work for money? Mercenaries. <laughs> I was at a conference at Hoover a couple of days ago, and I was telling this uh, this historian who's at Texas A and M, and I gather a horse here faces a certain <laughs> way, doesn't face a certain way. And I was telling her this story, and she hadn't heard it, so I sent her a copy of my article uh, yesterday about it. She, I got a note from her last night. It was titled from a mercenary professor to a mercenary professor. <laughs> now, I've kind of held off on some of the suspense. What was the result of the Gates Commission? What did they come out against or in favor of? And this was not a typical commission. Usually they appoint a commission to punt something down the road so people forget about it. Or they line up people who you know exactly what they're going to do, and they're supposed to all agree and do it. This wasn't that at all. This was what surprised me. Fifteen members, five opposed to the draft, five in favor of the draft, five in between on the fence. So, so, so Friedman and Meckling and all those people realized, we're going to have to make a case. We're going to have to persuade people. And they did. So when the report came out, the result was 14 to 0, with one abstention who said very explicitly he wasn't against what they decided, but he'd been sick, he'd missed most of the hearings, and didn't feel like he could do it without knowing more. And that man was a uh, black leader named Roy Wilkins, and I've got a copy of his letter here, and here's the one thing I want to just emphasize, the part in bold. I would like to endorse the basic idea of moving towards an all-volunteer armed force, and to express my hope that you will be able to take steps in the near future to reduce reliance on conscription. 
So even the abstention was pretty good in that direction. Now there was another player in this, another economist who was one of the five against the draft, whom I got to know um, when I was a, a young academic. And that was a man named Alan Wallace. He was the president and later chancellor of the University of Rochester when I was a young assistant professor. And he gave, and I recommend try to find online, I bet you can, one of the best speeches I've ever read. It was 1968, height of the Vietnam War. He's in Rochester. He's invited to talk to the local, the Monroe County American Legion on their 50th anniversary. And here's part of what he says. The measure I propose will, I fear, shock some of you. I respectfully request that you nevertheless hear me out and think over my proposal carefully, rather than reject it out of hand. It is not a view I have come to lightly or recently, but one I have held for over 20 years. It is not original with me, nor is it without strong support from many respectable citizens of unquestionable patriotism. A step that would do much toward resolving our dilemma is to abolish the draft, abolish it completely, lock, stock, and barrel, abolish it immediately with no ifs, ands, or buts. He also dealt with the mercenary issue that Friedman was later to address, uh, quoting an economist colleague of his and mine named Harry Gilman. And Gilman had asked, why are officers who are encouraged to enter and to remain in the service by reasonably high levels of pay called dedicated career men, but privates who would volunteer when they, were too, when they too received higher levels of pay are called mercenaries. Incidentally, Wallace's speech was covered positively in a national magazine called The Nation. Anyone heard of that magazine? It's left wing, and it was left wing then, but they were agreed, or at least they were interested in that. Now, when I did my accident interview with him, when I left the University of Rochester in 1979, it was my last big chance to talk to him. And I said, you know, I'm a big fan of that speech. I never asked you what the audience reaction was. The Monroe County Legion 50th anniversary, and you come out against the draft in favor of abolishing lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, what do you think was the audience response, the audience reaction? <coughs> Any? Well, they were probably World War II and, and Korean vets, so they probably would have been happy with this possible. Well, I'm not sure why, but you got the bottom line right. They were happy. Not only were they happy, they gave him a standing ovation. And he shared with me a letter he got from someone that he wrote someone. He asked him what I'd asked. It was a friend of his. And he said, I don't know if I'd call it a standing ovation, but they stood and applauded. Uh, yeah, that's called a standing <laughs> ovation. So the draft ends. We have an economic boom in the late 1970s, plus high inflation, and Congress doesn't adjust pay very much. And so we have trouble meeting quality standards. So that's what led to Senator Sam Nunn's push to reintroduce the draft. So another candidate ran in 1980 named Ronald Reagan. And a friend of mine was on his uh, campaign staff, very, a young anti-draft friend, who drafted, so to speak, the part of his acceptance speech for the nomination where he said he would not only uh, not introduce the draft, but he would end draft registration. Oh, let me just backtrack. When they ended the draft, they kept draft registration. But there was a big deficit, budget deficit in 1975, so the Ford administration, to save money, ended draft registration. So we had five years there when there was no draft registration. And then President Carter reintroduced it with Congress in 1980. So Reagan says, I'm going to end it. And I wanted to force his hand. I wanted to put pressure on him, because I know how politicians are. So I came up with an economist statement against the draft and got a bunch of economists to sign it. And here's what I wrote. We, the undersigned, oppose moves toward the reimposition of the draft. 
The draft would be a more costly way of maintaining the military than an all-volunteer force. Those who claim that a draft costs less than a volunteer military cite as a savings the lower wages that the government can get away with paying draftees, but they leave out the burden imposed on the draftees themselves. Sound familiar? That's what I talked about earlier. Since a draft would force many young people to delay or forego entirely other activities valuable to them and to the rest of society, think of all those records Elvis Presley didn't make, the real cost of military manpower would be substantially more than the wages draftees would be paid. Saying that a draft would reduce the cost of the military is like saying that the pyramids were cheap because they were built with slave labor. And I got a whole bunch of economists to sign, and three magazines published it as a full-page ad without me having to pay anything. They liked it. Libertarian Review and Inquiry, two libertarian magazines. Plus, this was a big accomplishment. A magazine based in Madison, Wisconsin, called The Progressive. They ran it also. And among the people I got to sign it were Milton Friedman, Alan Greenspan, David Friedman, Donald McCloskey, who is now Deirdre McCloskey, William Meckling, William Niskan, and Murray Rothbard, and Bernie Smith, who has also spoken here. Uh, didn't work. Uh, the day Reagan was supposed to, around the time he was supposed to make his decision in his first term in office about ending registration, uh, the Soviets were threatening the Poles, and he thought it would send a bad signal. So, it didn't work. But, but, in the grand, in the bigger scheme of things, we won. The draft has been gone for, let's see, 1973, uh, 44 years. And think about what that means. Think of, of, of kind of the, the victory that represents. You experience the results of that victory every day. Think about your own lives, especially the young men. What if you decided you wanted to drop out of college? I'm not proposing that you do. It might be a good idea, it might be a bad idea. But dropping out of college in 2017 is very different from dropping out of college in 1970. Why? There's no draft. I mean, think about Bill Gates. He dropped out of Harvard after two years. If he had done, if he'd been 20 years older, and done that in the late 60s or early 70s, even 10 years older, actually, he might not have formed Microsoft. He might have been drafted. So it had a huge, huge positive effect on you. Um, oops, that's not there. So it's a victory. It's a huge victory. It's a partial victory. Every once in a while, a congressman comes along and tries to get rid of registration. I got a call from a congressman's office about a year ago, and it turned out Ben told them to call me because they called him first. And so he had a bill to get rid of it. Nothing's happened to it. But that's the next step, I think. Let's get rid of that. Thank you. <laughs>